We're live now on Capitol Hill for a forum with African-American Republican leaders looking at the black community, the conservative movement, and how to bring more people of color to the Republican Party. Among the speakers you'll hear this morning, Missouri Congressman Emanuel Cleaver, former Republican National Committee Chair Michael Steele, and former Congressman J.C. Watts, among others. Florida Republican Congressman Alan West is the host, and he is addressing the uh, group right now. My dear colleague, Tim, he had a lot of excitement last week down in South Carolina, so... Now that excitement is coming to Florida, so I'll take some notes from Tim. But uh, I think the, the whole purpose for us being here today is how do we articulate and connect the conservative principles back to our black community, African-American community? Because I really believe at the core of the African-American community truly is conservatism. And we just have to be able to understand what that is. And so when we talk about those conservative principles and what we're going to get into a discussion today, you know, limited government, understanding what effective and efficient limited government is that is fiscally responsible and constitutionally mandated, understanding individual sovereignty, the rights and freedom of the individual and how it relates to then their responsibility and their accountability. I think that we also have to understand there's a difference between equality of opportunity and equality of achievement for the individual. And what does that mean? Our free market system. And I think that's why I have to tip my hat off to my colleague, Chairman Sam Graves of Missouri, and the Small Business Committee staff for allowing us to be here in the Committee on Small Business Hearing Room. Because if you remember, one of the great strengths of the black community were small businesses. And we got to look at how do we get that empowerment back into the urban community. And I think that when you go back and you listen to people like former uh, past uh, Congressman Jack Kemp and also Art Laffer, when they talked about urban empowerment zones, we have to look at how we can get that restarted. Our traditional cultural values, really the core of who we are as African Americans, education, language, faith, family. But let us not forget security, a strong national defense, because no matter how prosperous you make the people, you must keep them safe. So today, as we go through, we want to look at those principles and look at the situation in the black community today, where we have unemployment close to 17 percent for black adult males 20 years of age and older, 16.4 percent, black teenagers 40.7 percent unemployment. Something has to be done, and there has to be a different way we can tackle this problem. So with that being said, I want to take the time now to introduce a woman that is on the forefront out there of bringing conservative principles into the African-American community. She walks the walk. She talks the talk. She does it all. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you our moderator for today, Ms. Star Parker. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here with you this morning. I really appreciate the opportunity to moderate this great panel. I believe this is historic, and one of the reasons I believe it's historic is because usually panels that convene here in Washington are talking about grievances and justices, government programs, but we're convening here today, as Congressman West has already alluded to, to talk about freedom and to talk about opportunity. We convene here today to talk about black responsibility as well as black rights. So this is indeed historic. But first, let me thank again Congressman West for his vision and leadership. Congressman West is a hero. And in gathering together, some of you, uh, when you were here earlier, you had came up to him, you under your pictures, I know that you agree with me to say he's a hero and a leader, not just from wearing our nation's uniform and fighting on our behalf on battlefields afar. Now he's here in Washington, D.C. as our hero, and we just really appreciate it. Uh, perhaps the next time we see him, his next step will be to become our nation's first black Republican president. We admire you, Congressman West. Your message has been inspiring enough to unseat a liberal Democrat and get elected in a district that in the last three presidential elections voted for Barack Obama, John Kerry, and Al Gore. What a leader and inspiration you are. Thank you. Now, before I get started, I want to see if uh, the chief of staff to Senator Rob Portman is still here. I know that he came in for a minute. Yes, Mr. Rob Lehman would like to address Congressman West as well for bringing this forum together. Thank you very much. I'm uh, sorry I had to uh, get back over to the other side of the Capitol, but I just wanted to thank um, you all. 
organization for having this event today. We would also uh, like to reach out and um, have it uh, on the other side of the Capitol, maybe the next meeting that uh, you were going to take. And I had a couple of our um, current staffers and former staffers. Um, Asia, who um, was an intern for us and now is, after she graduated law school, uh, came back to the Capitol for us. And then also Tiffany Moore. Tiffany was with us at the United States Trade Reps Office. And one of the things that we're really striving to do in Senator Portman's office is to try to get uh, young black students an opportunity in our offices. Uh, it's an underrepresented um, group in a lot of Republicans' offices. And I would ask for your assistance moving forward. And I apologize for having to, to leave uh, early, but I know Asia and others are going to stay here. And thank you for your work and look forward to working with you. Well, thank you. Thank you for those kind words. And as Congressman West just told us about the unemployment rate in the black community, since your announcement just went out on C-SPAN that you have positions available, I am sure you will get a lot of applications. <laughs> this is a time when our country needs fixing, and there's no other group of Americans more qualified to understand what is wrong in America and what needs fixing than America's black citizens. The moral and monetary state of black America is a mirror reflection of the moral and monetary state of our great country. We as a nation are indeed in crises. We're at a critical crossroads similar to in the 1850s where we just cannot go on half free and half enslaved, half makers and half takers. We must make a decision about who we will be if we are to remain a united nation, biblical and responsible or secular and entitled. And there's no other ethnic group in America that has suffered more from the misuse of government, the misuse of politics and political power, and has more to gain by restoring traditional values and individual responsibility, free markets, limited government, and a strong national allegiance than blacks. So I think it very appropriate and timely that Congressman West would host this important forum at the beginning of year 2012. And again, I thank him. And I am indeed humbled for this opportunity to moderate this morning. I also want to thank his staff and legislative assistant, Reginald Darby, for this forum, for the topics. And I appreciate that he also allowed me to weigh in on developing the questions and to select which panelists would answer. Thank you, C-SPAN, for capturing this event for the whole world to see. And I want to thank all of you that are in our audience this morning, uh, today, and for attending. Now I'm going to get to some ground rules. The Black Conservative Forum is for two hours. And how do you address the state of our country, our community, and our future in two hours? So after rocks, paper, scissors, we have five topics on the table. Two questions in each and 15 minutes per topic. The topics are perception versus reality, urban issues in the 21st century, the black church and state, the true history of civil rights, and conservative principles in the black community. We have 14 brilliant panelists of whom I will specifically ask two questions each. I will ask three panelists to address the same question and then move on to the next question with three different panelists. Now, I did think that if you uh, disagree with something that was said by a panelist that was asked the question, you can chime in for only a minute. And then we'll have opportunity later for you to address the question again. Because once we have completed the five topics, ten questions total, I will ask the final question on GOP outreach, which will be open to all the panelists. Plus, we have two very special guests in our audience that will also uh, be asked of that question and will uh, address it. One is Garland Hunt, who is the president of Prison Fellowship, and the other is Troy Town, who is the Montgomery Tea Party. And they will address that question as well. And if there is a panelist that did not get a question earlier but has a burning answer within them, that would be the time to address that. If we can stay on time, we should have 15 minutes for audience Q&A and the remaining time for Congressman Allen West to close this historic event. Now, what we're going to do for housekeeping on the questions that will come from the audience, you will just ask your question from your seat, and then I will repeat the question. Now, introduction of our fine panel, our host, Congressman Alan West. Oh, I have to say one thing before you say hello again for the third time, uh, Congressman West. When I call your name that I'm introducing the panel, you have a one breath sentence to say a little bit more about who you are. Congressman West, we know you. You don't get your minute. Happy to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Congressman Tim Scott, R, South Carolina. Good morning. 
We want a little more than that in your one breath sentence. We want to know, South Carolina, did you ever pick a pony in that race? I've got to have a deeper breath for that conversation there. <laughs> it is good to be with you here, and I think it's very important for us to recognize that as we continue looking for ways to encourage African Americans to become a part of the Republican construct or the conservative movement, we may, we may need to focus more on the issues that drive us together than the the forums that give us an opportunity to have a, a black specific conversation. We, I think at some point we're going to have to have a conversation that's specific to the issues that drive our numbers uh, in the community. Well, we'll hope we'll address some of those things today. We are also going to be joined by Congressman Jim Jordan. I don't believe he's here yet. Uh, was running a little late due to flight complications and the weather, but he will be joining us. And he is chairman of the RSC, the Republican Study Committee, as well as an elected official from the great state of Ohio. We have Congressman Emanuel Cleaver, also not with us yet. Um, I understand that he also had flight complications and Democrat from Missouri and also the chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus. And we hope that he will be able to join us as well. Former Congressman J.C. Watts is also with us this morning. We want to thank you. Thank you, Star. And I just want to uh, add my uh, thanks to uh, Congressman West and all of those that uh, put this together and organized it. And I know that uh, um, this, this takes a lot of work and a lot of effort on behalf of a lot of people. And so thanks to all of those who were involved in this. And I look forward to uh, the dialogue and the discussion this morning. Good. I believe that the uh, Congressman West staff sent out the questions, but they don't know uh, which one they're going to get. That's why they're all trying to be nice to me now. <laughs> Sheriff uh, Octavia Johnson from Roanoke, Virginia, welcome, and thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning. I, too, want to thank uh, Congressman West for uh, inviting me here to be here on this morning, and uh, I believe it's to be, it's important for us to be a leader within our communities and keep the people informed as to uh, our, what our uh, thoughts and our commitments are to the public. Thank you. Thank you. City Council Member Bill Cleveland, Alexandra, Virginia. Uh, former city council member. <laughs> former uh, city council member Bill Cleveland. Yeah, I'm, on I'm, his way to Washington, D.C., perhaps, uh, to be I'm just, <laughs> representative here. I'm just uh, glad to be here. I'm a substitute teacher in the Alexandria school system. Wow. I'm a former vice mayor. I ran for mayor of the city of Alexandria. didn't win. But I still work with the, with the community. And I just came here. I was sitting out in the audience, and I saw my name here, and I said, wow, I'm supposed to be here. So thank you very much, Congressman West, for uh, <laughs> inviting me to be a part of this, because I am really excited uh, uh, to answer questions. Well, thank you. I'm glad that you joined us. Mayor Gal B. Fields, Lakeland, Florida. Well, good morning. I'll add my gratitude to Congressman West for convening this panel, and I look forward to being a part of the conversation. And and also making sure that we're all committed to the long view on, on this very important subject. All right. Now, the one breath rule was to tell us something about yourself. And so now I'm going to have to tell about everybody. And some I couldn't find their bios on the web. But I do know the mayor because I've been in his beautiful city in Lakeland. And what a wonderful inspiration he is for his community. Alabama community activist Fred Solomon. Welcome. Thank you. Well, you talk about wondering why you're here. Uh, that's certainly what I'm doing, is wondering why I'm on this panel. But obviously, I, I come to this as, from a little different perspective than, than, than most of you. But growing up in a, in a rural town in South Alabama in the 40s, as the, in the, in the only Jewish family in the entire county, much less the town, uh, was an experience. Uh, and I'm an old guy. I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, believe me. And I've, and I've felt your pain. Uh, but I, I would just like to say that, that I think Americans who happen to have black skin are the same as Americans who happen to have white skin in that they want to have meaningful employment. They want to have, they want to spend time with their children um, have some private time with their mates, 
and mostly they'd like to see their children graduate from high school and go to college, not drop out of high school and, and go to prison. So thanks for having me here. Well, we appreciate that. And that means I might have to ask you about educational choice and options. Next, we have Louisiana Pastor C.L. Bryant. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Stop. And should I say Tea Party activists as well, which is not on my notes, but in case you decide not to say that, I will. Absolutely. And uh, thank you, Star and Colonel West, for having us all here today. I am the creator of the Runaway Slave movie. Uh, also, um, One Nation Back to God Ministries, and I'm a former president of the NAACP in Garland, Texas. I've seen both sides of the street, and I certainly hope that this particular um, conversation that started today will help us uh, engage in dialogue that will be meaningful to all Americans here in this very um, important year, election year of 2012. And we must not fail in our efforts to do what's necessary to bring about this discussion. And again, I want to thank you, Star, and of course, uh, Colonel Allen West, who is a shining example of what a, an American can be, bl red, yellow, black, or white, in this country. Thank you. Community activist Christine Brooks, has she been delayed? All right, Christine Brooks has been delayed. Have we heard from her at all? That she's not going to be able to make it? That I'm going, she is coming? Okay, thank you. All right, Frederick Douglass, Republicans founder, K. Carl Smith, and author, I should say. Thank you, Star. Thank you, Congress, for the opportunity to share uh, some moments this morning. We could find some fixes to some ills in our community and how we can broaden the base of the conservative movement. And uh, so I'm happy for the opportunity to be here. Appreciate it. And author and Alabama activist, Dr. Carney C. Smith, Sr. Good morning, uh, oh, there you are. Congress, okay. Congressman West and to Dr. Star Parker. Doctor? Thank you for the invitation to come and to share, and happy to be with you to uh, share in this special moment. Thank you. You're welcome. Very, very nice to have you. And then finally, but not least, we have Sheriff David Clark, Jr., Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Thank you, Star. Good morning. Distinguished members of the panel here today. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I come from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, a city with a lot of issues, a lot of issues. 55% black male unemployment, truancy and graduation rate, truancy rate of 60%. 60% of students in the Milwaukee public school system do not attend school regularly. They only graduate 50% of the uh, students that do, and when they come out of there, the diploma's not worth the, the paper that it's written on. They probably can't even read it. We have the worst fourth and eighth grade reading scores in the nation. We lead an infant mortality rate, and I could go on and on and on, but you get a sense of, of uh, where I'm at. I'm in law enforcement, so you know what that connection is. And uh, what's interesting is that it's a city that has forever been in the throes, if you will, the... the uh, the brace of liberal orthodoxy. And I've been a man alone, a man alone, trumpeting conservative values. And it's a struggle when you're a man alone and you don't have the support. So I'm pleased to be uh, in an audience with uh, like-minded thinking people. Thank you very much. And I appreciate you saying those words because actually I think it's one of the reasons that we're here. Most cities are reflective of what is happening in your city. But what's interesting and unique about Milwaukee and Wisconsin is it seems to be on the cutting edge of some of the ideas that we're even going to talk about today. This is the state that gave us the model for welfare reform. This is the state that gave us the model for school choice vouchers. So um, as the scripture says, where sin abounds, grace much more. And so again, I'm privileged that we were able to convene so that we can talk about these issues from another perspective. We have to get into the realities, the perceptions, and where we go from here as an African-American people. 
Now we're going to move on into the forum and the topics of the forum. The first being perception versus reality. And so question one is going to go to, and forgive me panelists ahead of time, I'm going to shoot off your last names uh, when I ask a question. And as I, I'm going to reiterate that how you'll get a question, I'm going to ask three people the same question that will move on to the next. If you have a burning thought or idea on a question that you weren't ask, then go ahead and chime in, but keep your, um, your words brief so that we can get to everybody and that we can get to every question. So question one is going to go to West, Cleveland, and Solomon, and it's about the perception, and it's really interesting, and what a segue from what um, Sheriff Clark just said about the social suicide that many black conservatives are faced with when they say, uh, I believe a little bit differently than you. The perception all blacks are liberal. The reality, one-third of blacks self-identify as conservatives. It's obvious then that Republicans have a branding and or marketing problem if 33% of blacks poll as conservatives, yet only 8 to 10% vote regularly with the GOP. What is the problem and how do we fix it? Congressman West? Well, I mean, you're absolutely spot on, and I think that that's why this type of forum is so important. Uh, I'll give you a great uh, example. Uh, just about uh, a week ago, I was speaking at a, uh, an installation ceremony for a rabbi in Boynton Beach. And after I spoke, and of course I used some references from the Old Testament to talk about transitions of leadership, uh, the rabbi's uncle came up to me and started speaking to me. And, uh, you know, his first assumption, well, you know, you're a member of Congress, he said, and he started talking about the Democrat Party. And when I told him that I was a Republican. He had this look on his face. That, you know, it was just, it was a Kodak moment. And, uh, and then I told him, I said, well, you know, I'm that guy. Um, so I think it's very important that we take it upon ourselves. You know, I don't need to sit back and wait for a party to do something that I know needs to be done. And one of the challenges I tell people is that everybody has a BlackBerry. Everyone is on a computer or whatever. Everyone is a media source. And each and every one of us sitting here today, we have an email list. And the people out there in the listening audience, you have email lists. How many people are going to look at this thing on C-SPAN right now? And I know it's going to be replayed several other times. How many people are going to send it out with the YouTube clips that are going to be there? That's how we break down the perception. Yeah. And we can't have this fear of standing up and saying who we are. Because there are so many times you go out and people will come up to you and say, Hey, you know, Wes, I, I agree with you too. Right. And you're like, well, why are you whispering? Okay. <laughs> you know, we shout at football games. We shout in church. We need to start shouting about the principles that make us who we are. But first of all, I think that we need to have this conversation of articulating what those principles are. Thank you. Bill? Well, with me, it begins with being in the community and being seen. And when they see you, they can't believe it. And then they say, they ask me, Bill, well, really, what is your philosophy? And I tell them the same as yours, but I'll, I'll give you the creed that I stand by. And it's one that a man wrote a good while ago. I believe that the free enterprise system is the most productive supplier of human ease and economic justice. I believe that all individuals are entitled to equal rights, justice, and opportunities, and should assume the responsibilities as citizens of free society. I believe that fiscal responsibility and budgetary restraints must be exercised at all levels of the government. I believe that the, I believe that individ, uh, the government must preserve individual liberty by upholding constitutional limitations. I believe that peace is best preserved through a strong national defense. And finally, I tell them, I believe that faith in God is recognized by our founding fathers is essential to the moral fiber of this nation. And they say, Bill, this is what I believe in. Right. I said, well, welcome to the Republican Party. <laughs> because that's what we believe in. And they say, well, you know, well, you're, you're different from them. I said, no, I'm not any different from them. What you have to do is you have to be here. If you believe in it, then we can move and we can achieve it. Right. And they said, well, Bill, I'm with you, but I'm not with them. And I'll vote for you. I said, but no, no, just don't vote for me. It's about the philosophy. the philosophy and you have that philosophy and you have it within you. Don't vote what you see. Vote what you know. 
Wow. And that's what changes them. All right, Fred, you have to follow that answer. <laughs> That's going to be tough. Well, it's going to be tough, but you're from Alabama. I'll do my best. <laughs> the question is, what's the problem and how do we fix it? Um, I think the problem is a combination of intellectual dishonesty, ignorance, and, and, and foolishness. Um, I believe that uh, our education system is, is largely responsible for this. We've allowed our primary and secondary education to be dumbed down to the lowest common denominator. Our higher education system is heavily influenced by liberal and sometimes extreme progressive agendas and tends to, teach, uh, tends to attempt to teach our young what to think instead of how to think. Mm -hmm. you know, we've stopped teaching critical thinking if we ever did. I think we did at one, one point. Uh, historical facts, especially facts pertaining to American history, are intentionally ignored and distorted at the college level. In fact, in many colleges today, you don't even have to take a course in American history to graduate. Um, Throw in a national media that, with all due respect, is mostly morally bankrupt and intellectually dishonest, in my opinion. Um, the intellectual dishonesty part is then complete. This leads to ignorance. Uh, we're all ignorant of something. Ignorance, you know, of true history of America and the founding of our country. Uh, and the true history of the Republican Party as it relates to black America. Um, regrettably, this ignorance of the truth and the facts makes people susceptible to professional race hustlers that sell racial division, outright lies, and hatred. Uh, you sprinkle in a heavy dose of far-left pop culture and presto, you have foolishness at warp speed. That's the problem as I see it. Now the fix, quickly, is to send gr grassroots foot soldiers like K. Carl Smith and my friend Troy Towns and other black conservatives, regular folks, into the minority community with the facts and the truth in a non-condescending way using the Frederick Douglass Republican model. Starting with the, states, the swing states, these foot soldiers must spread the truth, recruit, and train more as they go. They can use the truth as their sword and Frederick Douglass's values and words as their shield. But friends, this has got to start now. It's almost too late. Thank you for your very thoughtful answer. And one of the reasons that we're here is that I think inside all of us there's a great hope that it is not too late. Uh, Congressman Watts, uh, you wanted to weigh in on this, I believe. Yes, sir, I do. I, I, I've, I concluded a long time ago that most black people don't think alike. Most black people just vote alike. Mm -hmm. And I think the pertinent question for Republicans is, is, why is it that so many black people that agree with us, but they don't vote like us? Right. That's, that's a real question. Uh, perception in, in the arena that we are in, and in most arenas, it is reality. On my, it, in my church on Sunday mornings, if you come to our church and we give the impression that we don't care about you visiting our, our church, you're probably not going to come back. That's right. The, because of the per perception that we gave. And so I, I, I would hope that, um, that uh, in, in our discussion as we move forward that we would think about the perception. Do we have anybody here from the RNC this morning? Do we have anybody here from the uh, Senatorial Committee? Uh, do we have anybody... It, and they were invited. Perception. Uh-oh. Uh, well, you know, you, you know if, if, if I... It, it's... Uh, it's, it's <laughs> You know, this, this is the discussion that the institutions of the Republican Party, that they need to be involved with. How many people do we have at the strategic, strategic table at any of the presidential campaigns? 
Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, and I don't. I'm, I'm at the strategic table for one of them, but I think we need a, a Tim Scott or Alan. You don't need to be in the same camp that I'm in, but somebody that looks like us needs to be at the strategic table to say, I know what you're trying to say, but I wouldn't have said that like that. Right. You know. Right. So, so again. Perception is reality. I don't care if it's with Christians, if it's with Jews, if it's in the church, if it's in your organization, in my business, if my clients and my customers feel like I don't care about their needs, they're going to go somewhere else and buy a tractor. That's right. So we, we can't ignore this, per, the, this issue surrounding perception. You know, what, what Tim Scott and Alan West, and I, I've had to defend them in saying, look, you don't, you don't know these guys. Give them 15 minutes with you and give the other side 15 minutes with you. I'll wait the results in peace that we're going to get them sold. That's right. But, but friends, we, we do have to be concerned about the perception, and it just shouldn't be the people on this panel or the people in this room. Right. Thank you. I really appreciate that you would. Um, uh, okay, Carl, you're on the next question. Can I get 30 seconds on this issue? Yes. What I'd like to uh, mention that, and I agree with everything that's been said, the word conservatism has a negative kind of connotation in the black community. It's synonymous with racist. And the reason why, you got to remember now, you, you had conservative Democrats who did everything they could do to block civil rights legislation. They wrote the Jim Crow law and started the KKK. So as Republicans, we're picking up the same word. We have a different meaning. The Democrat conservatives just want to hold dear to the principles of the racist fathers. We want to hold dear to the principles of the founding fathers. Now, I don't use the word conservative to identify myself politically. I am a conservative. I'm a Frederick Douglass Republican, meaning that I believe in four life empowering values of Frederick Douglass. Respect for the Constitution, respect for life. I believe in limited government, and I believe in personal responsibility. That's what Douglass advocated, what he talked about. So when you, I don't say to, I'm not suggesting you don't use the word conservative, but make sure you define the word first based on the audience you're talking to. Frederick Douglass is the answer how we can take the conservative message to the black community. The quintessential constitutional conservative and a self-proclaimed Republican. He's the answer. His life has to be elevated. And that's how we're going to save our community, save this country, and get this country back toward constitutional conservatism. Okay, I'm going to go on to the next question, and I'm, since Congressman Jordan is not here yet, I'm going to allow uh, uh, Clark, Sheriff Clark, to take his turn and segue from the uh, comment that you just wanted to make. And actually, I want to make a mention about Jim uh, Jordan, because when you talk about the Republican Party, uh, J.C. Watts is exactly right. There is a branding and marketing problem, and there really at this point is no excuse. Uh, but Congressman Jordan heads up the Republican Study Committee, and they are doing everything they can to try to make a difference with us as African Americans, to try to right what has broken down uh, with the Republican versus black community uh, situation. So I'm going to move on to the next question because it's also on perception and reality. And it's really critical to the answers that you just heard because there is, in perception, a wide misconception that more government is better for low-income populations. But the reality is less government, whether in retirement, health care, education, green earth, labor laws such as minimal wage and Davis-Bacon Act would disproportionately benefit low-income Americans. Why is the misconception so embraced and why such mistrust of individual liberty and personal responsibility? Uh, Clark, Scott, and K. Carl Smith. Thank you. You know, the government handouts, big government uh, entitlement programs are used like an intoxicating drug. And when you wonder to yourself or you wonder out loud, why is it that individuals in our central cities, uh, black people, why they know, and it's easy when you talk logically, when you try to reason with folks, you're working on the wrong side of the brain. We need to appeal to the emotional side of the brain. We're an emotional people. We've overcome a lot. We, we deserve to be emotional. But that's a different side of the brain where logic and reason, which I'm hearing a lot of today, which being an independent thinker works with me, 
but it's not going to work with people whose thinking dominates on the right side, which is all emotion. So when you start talking about government handouts, you start talking about entitlement. That's a pleasing message, and it's very hard to, um, to overcome. Uh, Congressman uh, West talked about the fear from a lot of people in our community uh, and why they whisper and why they tend to take a, an underground approach to, to being conservative. Fear is tough to overcome. They're afraid. It's easy to say, hey, develop some courage and go out and stand up for what you believe in. When they see what happened to Clarence Thomas, right. when they see what happened to Herman Cain, when they see what happened to Michael Steele, who at one time was the head of the RNC, they look and go, uh-huh, see, I don't want that to happen to me. Most folks just want to go through life, raise their families, enjoy, and, and, and make a, a good way for themselves. They don't want to be in the belly of the beast like we are, people in this panel. They don't want to be there. So then I'd have to ask, where's the face? Because when something from the left comes up in the city of Milwaukee, they are real quick, the left, to get Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton to speak on behalf of all blacks, and we know that they don't. But there's still a face. Where's the face on the conservative side? And I'm not talking about someone who can speak for all blacks. But somebody mentioned it here earlier that someone who looks like us, where's the face of the conservative movement that you can send down into the, the gallows of our urban centers with the resources being able to connect emotionally, not reason and logic. You take a, re a message of reason and logic into the hood, if you will, it's not going to get you very far. You have to have a message that deals from the emotional perspective. So, you know, the, the left has a counter strategy for when we try to do this. They have a strategy. Don't let that balloon get off the ground. When you see it, like I'm in Milwaukee and I said I'm a man alone, Go get them. They give license to people to come after me, gatekeepers, if you will. They have a strategy to counter any plan or strategy that we might have to spread this word. So we need a face. We need a face on this movement. Well, I think we have quite a few here, uh, and I appreciate those comments. You reminded me of two things. One, Dr. King, when he said that men fear nothing more terribly than to stand out against prevailing opinion, he had trouble getting his movement started. And number two, when you talked about Milwaukee and how the left has strategy against us getting something done, it's one of the reasons I appreciate that we do have congressmen in the room who can pass laws to make realities on the ground better for a community that might not even know that they want those answers. So, Congressman uh, Scott, I would like for you to answer this question as well. Certainly. Thank you very much. i tell you... I guess I've had the opportunity to experience it from both sides, and one of the things that I had to be taught was that I was not a lost child needing some help from some very liberal, well-meaning, well-intentioned, big government coming to solve my problems. Growing up in a, in a single-parent household, living in abject poverty, and having the opportunity to successfully flunk out of high school in the ninth grade really helped me reach my conclusion that the more government came to help me, the less individually responsible I was going to be for myself. And so time and time again, my mama kept telling me this lesson that, boy, I brought you in the world, I might have to take you out. <laughs> so if you continue your behavior in the same direction you're going in today, the people that you think are here to help you are going to be the ones that are criminalizing you and putting you in jail because of your efforts and your activities on your own behalf. Mm -hmm. So the only person that you can blame is the one in the mirror. Unfortunately, when you listen to big government, what big government says is someone else caused your situation to happen. Right. And you are not responsible for where you are. The fact that your dad was gone gives you the reason why we have to treat you for the psychological deficiencies that you currently have. Unfortunately, when you arrive at the Charleston County Jail where I live, mm -hmm. they may give you some psychological assistance, <laughs> but it will be from the guy sitting next to you in the bed. And so the challenge we have today is a reality that the more government comes to rescue, the fewer people actually escape that place. And so how do we, how do we overcome that? And it's a simple formula. And realizing that the most successful businesses in the world today never ask the question, who's going to be in the White House and can I succeed? Right. They only want to know the state of the game. Right. They, only, they only want to know the rules of the game, the rules of the field, and they will play consistent with those rules. So the great challenge that we have 
is the challenge of selling and marketing the truth to people who are desperately seeking the truth. But in the absence of truth, in the absence of good salespeople, what they'll do is they'll drink anything, sand, dirt, and not water. And so what I think we have to do in order to address the, the misconception that somehow government comes to rescue you is to tell our own stories. America's success is a story of struggle and then triumph, right. tragedy and more triumph. The only way you get something for nothing is from the government. And the only way that actually works out for you is when you realize that the, nothing you're, the something you're getting for nothing is an absolute chain around your wrist that leads you in the direction that they want you to go. So it's really not something for nothing. It's something for the incredibly high price of your freedom. And, and that great challenge that we have to overcome is a challenge that has been mixed in this stew for so long that it is now inseparable for so many people in their conscience. I can't separate how I can be successful without the government. Right, right. We think the guy at the White House is going to solve our problems. I don't care whether he's a Republican or a Democrat. At the end of the day, I'm going to succeed because I've been given the inalienable right and the opportunity for success. I was given the great birthright of being an American. Right. And so if we don't start having a conversation about the underlying issues, uh, it doesn't matter what the political consequences, right. the political reality is that we're in. Well, I appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Because that is very true. And listening to you, Congressman uh, Scott, we're not only pleased that you're in the Congress and in a position that has the bully pulpit, but you reminded me how at a point people do get it for their own lives. After all of these political promises where their families have collapsed, their communities are still sitting in ruin. And so polling just came out a couple of days ago to show that the African-American community now about 13 percent are saying we don't want this diet anymore. It's not a lot, uh, you know, for and some can look at that glass half full or empty. 87 percent are still with uh, the current administration and some of the uh, promises that they're making. But for us to have, see that type of movement in such a short period of time, maybe some are starting to look at their own uh, reality. And I would say, Star, to that, uh, four decades of a war on poverty yeah. and the same people of Poe yeah. Yeah. You know. ought to be a lesson in itself. Yeah. Now, you read my book, Uncle Sam's Plantation. All right, quite, uh, answer here. And we're going to have to keep them a little shorter because you know we have a lot of topics to get through, and the t clock is running. Yes, Can I go? Just, just real quick, as, as, as we say in, in, in South Alabama, we cut to the chase. What these gentlemen are saying is that, is that you, we, are, are losing the propaganda war, is what it is. Uh, you know, uh, we, got the, we got the right stuff and the right message, but we're losing the, the propaganda war. It's, it's that simple. You know, I, perhaps... But again, if I can thank Congressman West, because we're in a new year. And I believe, as was mentioned by our leader of the Days Forum, the Internet and other technology that is now on our side, I'm just not sure that yesterday's reality is tomorrow's reality. The next topic... Start, I get my chance to respond to that question. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Can we introduce the Chairman Cleaver? Yes, please. I would like to introduce... Hello, Manuel Cleaver, who's joined us. Congressman Cleaver is from the great state of Missouri, as I mentioned earlier, and he's also the chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus. And you're right on time, because the next round of questions, I actually have one for you. So I really appreciate that you sat down. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. What I want to quickly say, and I agree with all the comments made, uh, Congressman Scott said something very interesting, and I agree with that. It's a sales and marketing strategy that we have to uh, overcome. It is a question of propaganda. Thank God we have a literary legacy of Douglas's writings. The things that we're talking about, Douglas experienced all this, and he wrote about it. He gave us the solution. That's why his life had to be studied, and we had to elevate Douglas. Douglas was born below poverty. He was born a slave. He didn't even, didn't even own his own body. But in, in his writings, he talked about his slave master approached him and told him, Douglas, make no plans for the future. I'll take care of you. Make no plans for the future. And Douglas talked about the role of the federal government is not to uh, provide for us. Douglas said the role of the national government is to protect us. That's what it's supposed to do. So with this sense of government protecting us and not providing for us, then it comes in uh, personal responsibility. So Douglas is the key to all this. Yeah. 
You can't play the race card on the Frederick Douglass Republicans. I'm going to have to move on. And we do have another round where we'll allow for others to weigh in. Uh, you're absolutely right. I remember when they asked uh, our hero, Frederick Douglass, uh, so what then should we do with the Negro? He said, do nothing with the Negro. <laughs> Urban issues in the 21st century. Question one goes to Watts, Cleaver, Clark, Jr. Getting school choice into urban America has been a tremendous battle against unions and traditional civil rights groups. What is the problem? Why wouldn't we as a society want money to follow students of poor parents to the school of their choice, whether that school is public, private, non-sectarian, religious, charter, or home schools? What? You know, I, th I think any of these things... You know, in the political arena, it's no different in politics than it is a pastor getting up on Sunday morning and delivering a sermon and, and, and being in, in an arena that you are competing for the hearts and minds of the people sitting in the audience. And politics now, get, of course, gets a little bit nastier than, than it does on, on Sunday mornings, but, but be that as it may, um, it's... it's um, it's it's important the delivery who's delivering it um, you know people uh, people being engaged etc and I think when you look at a lot of the battles that I think that that's been fought you know for so long people have been made and, and not just people and in, in, in the black community but people in many communities for so long they've been told that two plus two is seven then all of a sudden someone comes along and says eh, and two plus two is four. I say, oh, he's forgotten where he's come from. You know, well, I think we all should should want um, the facts. And and we have uh, um, Keiko James said to me once, and I think we've talked about conservative this morning. I think Kay gave the best definition, and I, I, I talked about it in my book. I think she gave the best definition of conservative that I've ever heard. And she said, conservative is living the way your grandmama taught you to live. <laughs> you treat other people the way you want to be treated. You don't spend out more money than you take in. You, you, you don't waste. You, you, don't, you don't get yourself deeply in debt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the list goes on. I don't have to tell you, tell you that. I see some gray hairs in there, so you all know what I'm talking about. But, but, I, but I think <clears throat> we are in a competition for the hearts and minds of the American people on, econ on, on taxes, uh, on economic development, on, on um, you know, Jack Kemp. I'm a Jack Kemp disciple. I mean, Jack knew the value of going in and, and, and into those underserved communities and, 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 and doing things to say we've got to eliminate taxes and regulatory policy in this community in order to attract capital here simply because capital is a coward. You invest your money just like every other Republican and Democrat or liberal or conservative in this country. When you invest your money, you want to return. And the money that you invest is not going to flow. You're not going to invest your money into a, a, an industry that's over-regulated, over-litigated, and over-taxed. But on the question, then, why is it so hard to get school choice? I mean, we know that the Supreme Court has ruled that it is not unconstitutional for money to follow children to the parents of their choice. This happened <clears> in 2003. Yeah, every community that attempts to pass a voucher movement has strict opposition. I mean, we're talking yeah. vicious opposition from the left, from unions and from traditional civil rights uh, groups, including the NAACP. They're on every lawsuit that we see when someone fights for school choice. So that is the and question Star, on the and, table. And, and What's was, the problem? And I was going and, and I, I was, I was to segue into that in, 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 in terms of school choice, saying, saying that Margaret Thatcher said, win the argument, you'll win the vote. We've not won the argument. Well, I'm you know, not sure in, that's, well, well, but in, but in, ma in major issues, so we'll any any major issue, I don't care if it's a balanced budget. Uh, I no, don't on care. school choice. Let's no, stay no, on I'm this saying parental subject. choice. Any of, obviously, we we we've not won the argument if 
70, I've seen numbers that anywhere from 68 to 87 percent of the people in the black community support parental choice and education. Yes, they do. So why aren't we getting it? What is the problem when you talk about a community? And I'm going to ask um, uh, Congressman Cleaver this, and I see that Tim wants to address this as well. There is a problem with the community saying they want something this critical to their future, connected specifically to their economic well-being, and yet they have to fight the NAACP and all of the unions and and other left-wing groups to get money to follow their children but, to the but, schools. But they Scott, want. No, I'm going to let go me on close. To, let me close okay, by ten seconds by saying we'll go ahead. It, it, the very first comments that we made in this room today was people that look like us, but they don't vote like us. Right. So it, it is more than just the issues that we're dealing with: parental choice and education, enterprise zones. But on school Balanced choice, then, budgets. all right, let, let, let's let um, Congressman Cleaver, you come from a state where we know the hard parts of that state, St. Louis and Kansas City. Both have tried to get school choice voucher initiatives. Both have been overwhelmingly hit hard by the left. What's the problem? Why can't money follow children to the schools that their parents want them to go to, whether it's a public, private, religious, charter, and or home school? Uh, I apologize for being late. No worries. Uh, I was on a conservative down. airplane, and <laughs> it, it, it got, gas, yeah. <laughs> Didn't have another thing. Um, <laughs> oh no, you weren't on a conservative plane, brother, because they would have got you here on time. Okay, yeah. it would have been a private jet, and you would have been here on time. You were on a commercial union-controlled airplane. Uh, plane landed safely. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, and, and I want to thank uh, my, my colleague, my friend, uh, Alan West, for uh, inviting me to be here. Um, Kansas City and St. Louis, uh, Missouri, Kansas City, and the, the largest city in the state is Kansas City, St. Louis, the second largest. Both cities have decertified school districts. When I came to Kansas City out of uh, college, out of Prairie View, uh, we, we had 74,000 students in Kansas City in the public school system. Today, there are 16,000. There, 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 are only, there are only two cities in the, in the state where you can have uh, charter schools, um, Kansas City and St. Louis. Uh, I think the argument that, that you are making, I would agree with, except there's, there's one problem. Um, the, there are still those schools uh, which would deny access to African Americans. And I think that uh, uh, they are fewer than they were when I was in school, but they are there. And so uh, I, I think you'll find it's not the NAACP, it's the NAACP Legal Fund, which is they're completely separate and not the same uh, as, as being je- what being jealous runs. But Oh, right, that's right. He's actually focused on dismantling yeah. marriage. Um, it is a legal fund that is fighting school choice. Yes. So uh, uh, I have four children. Uh, when I was elected mayor... Uh, Jim Kit, uh, uh, Phil, uh, Kit, uh, Kirkpatrick, a reporter for the Kansas Star, came and asked me, he said, we're getting criticism because uh, uh, you're getting criticism because people say your children are going to a private school. And I said to him, let me tell you something. You can write whatever you want to write about me. Go ahead and do it. You leave my children alone. Uh, when I ran for mayor, uh, I didn't run my children for anything. And I'm going to send them to the best school that I can get them in. Uh, and so I, I believe uh, that we ought to send our children to schools that can produce. I agree with you on that. All I'm saying is that you're going to find resistance only because there are schools that still uh, fight. And we just had it in Missouri. We just, oh, I know. <laughs> where, where, they, where they just fought off allowing black students to come to a, uh, uh, some schools. Yeah, all right. Uh, Congressman Scott, it should we keep African-American children or low-income children in failing schools until there's some type of racial equality into other schools in that particular state? Of course not. L- let me say this. Uh, I, as a state legislator, for two years I fought for the school choice legislation to free kids from schools that are impoverished and having low results because the bottom line is you can't get a good education if you can't get a good education and the unions in the education world are more committed to the structure of education than they are to the child. Mm. And the only way to solve the problem is a very simple com. Uh, concept here. If you don't vote for the future of our children, we ought not vote for you. Well, yeah. I don't care whether you're black, white, Republican, or Democrat. At the end of the day, until we start saying that the child is the future 
and vote consistent with a child's future, it doesn't matter. And the problem is that we're not doing that. When you look at South Carolina, where 44 cents on the education dollar goes where the student is. That means 56 cents on the dollar goes to fund the apparatus around the kit. We have a dysfunction and a deficiency that is structural in nature, and the teachers' unions fund Democratic candidates and Democratic members of the House, and therefore we lost a vote by one or two folks. Right. And the caucus, unfortunately in my state, voted for the continuation of a poor educational choice and a poor educational outcome and future spending in government because they refuse to give the average child in a poor neighborhood a quality education. Yes. This is happening all over the place, and sometimes it's the unions have the Republicans in their pocket, too, because we just lost up in Pennsylvania as a result. But I think that what Congressman Watts was saying is appropriate here, that it connects to other issues, and that's one of the reasons that they will not separate out and vote for somebody that has their child's best interest as opposed to the other issues. Uh, Dr. Smith, you had to uh, weigh in on this one. I know this is not my question, but I've been trying to wait for my question, but I You'll have to say one. something. You'll get one. We haven't been able to get to everybody it, But yet. I have to say something here. <laughs> when we take the Federal Douglas Republican message to the black community, the churches, to the hood, mm -hmm. Douglas in 1848 went through the same problem of school choice. Right. He was trying to send his daughter, Rosetta, she was nine at the time, nine years old, to send her to Seward Seminary. Okay, they, the, the Board of Education of Rochester tried to force him to send his daughter to an, to an inferior school outside of his district. And Douglas said, no, 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 no. My, my, my money should follow my child. Douglas said the inability for a parent to not have the power to choose the school of their choice is worse than slavery. Now, this is Frederick Douglass. This is 1848. 1848. And Douglas says, no, I'm going to send her there because she's my child and she deserves the best education possible. And you are not determined for me what I would do for my child. 1848. So Douglas said, eight years later, that school system was integrated because Douglas put pressure on the school system. Right. One of his mottos or motifs for Douglas is face it, fight it, fix it. Face it, fight it, fix it. That's right. Face it, fight it, fix it. Mm. And, and by, by fighting, he, mean, he meant pressure, political pressure, media, newspaper. He's a writer. He's an he's a, a, owned two newspapers. He put pressure on the system until they changed the decision where the least of these are elevated and the most vulnerable are valued. Wow. And that's what he did. And that's what he did. Face it, well, we fight really it, appreciate fix that. Yep. Face it, fight it. Fix it. I believe you mentioned that in your book, and I think that it's appropriate now and even today because this very day the school choice movement is convening, and so we are still fighting and trying to fix it. Uh, Bayo uh, is representing their Institute for Justice, the Alliance for School Choice, still fighting in our harder hit communities. In fact, uh, I think there's about 14 active voucher programs in the country today, and 41 different states are considering legislation. So it is very, very important, very alive, and I like that. Face it, if you don't have quality education for your child, fight it, and then we can get it fixed so that they can have a brighter future. The second question in this urban issues uh, in the 21st century uh, topic area will go to Fields, Johnson, and Bryant. And the question, economic revitalization of poor communities through deregulation and lower taxes is not a new idea. In fact, Congressman Watts mentioned uh, the late, great Jack Kemp, who opined for decades on enterprise zones to attract business interest into our hard-hit and at-risk communities. Today, well-known and respected NYC University economist Paul Romer has third-world countries like the Honduras considering ideas of charter cities. It seems Kemp's dream is coming true in foreign countries, even like Rwanda. What is going on here in America? Why don't we have our economic enterprise zones on, alive by now? Can poor communities in America be revitalized by reducing corporate taxes and protectionist regulations in targeted zones and or zip codes? Fields, Johnson, Bryant. Good morning. In responding to this question, it, it, Mayor, it, I should say at this point, because I think this is your first question. It, it sure is. The mayor, thank you. 
In responding to this question, though, the, the answers really revert back to the same things that have already been said. Um, and and I, I, no disrespect to anyone else, but I, I believe Congressman Watt said it extremely well. People have listened to the 2 plus 2 equals 7 so long that they write it, they email it, they text it, and they believe it. And when you show up with the truth, it's not received. And, and one of the things that, that we're dealing with is that not only have we lost the misbranding battle, we're losing the argument, but we, te we tend not to really understand what it is that we're up against. Uh, d you know, Democrats have been very successful at labeling black Republicans as traitors, and that's how we're portrayed in the community. So when we show up with the truth or a solution, it's not well received. And what we've got to do is to find a better way of stepping up our game like business people on the marketing front. I have an insurance and financial services business. Mm -hmm. I can't show up and tell someone I want to sell you some insurance or I want to sell you this or that. I have to understand where they're coming from and make sure that they know that there is a solution that will solve that problem, that will heal that ache and that pain. We've not done a good enough job in making sure that we do that. We've also got to make sure that we overcome a lot of the miseducation that's taking place for people to know that we do, in fact, understand the issues and the concerns. When we poll that people believe in, in, in uh, charter schools or in school choice the way we do, but then they don't accept it, we, can't, you know, we cannot forget how much resistance there's going to be from other blacks who are on the other side that don't want to give up power and influence. Right that are going to make sure that we're portrayed as the enemy and the traitor that has turned our back on our people, and they're the ones that should be trusted. Not all of them are that way, but we need to understand that that is a part of what going, is going on. And when you mix that in with our national and our state support network, not having us at the table, not including us in how the strategy and the messaging is done, when you hear the short uh, words or the rhetorical comments, it turns people off because they don't know that they're re really even being listened to or that the issues are understood. And whether it's this issue, school choice, or some other issue, it reverts back to the same thing. Mm -hmm. We have a multifaceted challenge, and we need, need to make sure that we, we understand it first and we deal with it in a much smarter way than we have been up to now. Now, the reason I chose yourself, and then I'd like Sheriff to um, weigh in on this one as well, in the community leaders, is because some ideas, I believe, don't have to be initiated at wa out of Washington, D.C. And when you talk about an enterprise zone uh, and, and the power of local governing, where's the breakdown? What is stopping uh, local activity, local people from, from fighting for uh, just removing some of these governmental barriers and taxes that have taken over our hard-hit communities so that business will come in? Uh, Sheriff Johnson, would you answer that, please? Mm. I believe that. I believe that we need to go into the communities and the people need to be educated and uh, we need to speak with them and see what their concerns are and that we take it all to the table. But a lot of people have not been taught. So once we teach the people within that community, let them know what is available to them and we need to get them out of their mindset into another mindset. Uh, set of the econ economy to move them forward, to bring them out of where they are and to provide them with the education of the services. And, and if we tell them what it is that we can do for them and get their input, a lot of people do not listen to the people that are living in those areas. And I think that once we get committees together from the people that live there, listen to them and then we then sit down and talk with each one of them and I think that they will have a better understanding and we need to have an understanding of the people that live within the community. Well, I think a lot of the spokespersons from the black conservative movement have a deep appreciation from living in a community. I know me myself, after seven years in and out of the grips of welfare, I think what might be confronting us here, uh, CL Pastor, uh, are two, is two-front battle. We're talking about getting law because we know that public policy shapes public behavior. We've had over the last 50 years policies that have 
basically paid for irresponsibility. So we we resulted in that. We start to look at now the breakdown, the collapse of family, which we'll get into a little bit later. So there is a message uh, uh, to the individual themselves, getting where they are and to bring them to understand some of the things that we've heard already today. When you're real poor, you know to, okay, do I want this or not? But it seems that there is a hand on the, on the governmental side to shape the policies necessary. And the question on the table is, can that be done on a local level when we look at initiatives like charter cities and our economic enterprise zones? It certainly can be done, uh, Star. We succeed as individuals, but we've been taught to succeed as groups. Now, we want to talk about it. It's, it's very easy for us all to get into the rut of overstating the obvious. Yeah. But what we want to talk about here today is solutions. And what we can do is, in fact, create our own enterprise zones. Right. Just uh, about 20 years ago, joined with people I call the top 20, we'd meet every three months. And 20 of us would bring $3,000 to this meeting. These were black men. These were men of color, of, of uh, Latino extraction. We'd, be th we'd bring $3,000 to this meeting. We had to trust each other in order to uh, consolidate that money together. And in consolidating that money at $3,000 among the, the 20 of us, that's $60,000. And in that year's time, we're talking about $240,000. What do we do with that money? We take that money and we find houses. We find businesses to buy that other ethnic groups in that community were already buying. And we turned them into businesses where we could put our people to work. We didn't just talk about the problem. We actually did something about it by investing in it ourselves, by having skin in the game. In your school question, didn't get a chance to weigh in, and I know we're not talking about that. But right, but go ahead and weigh in, and we're going to have to make these answers a little shorter as well if we're right. going to get to all of the topics. But yes, I want you to weigh in on that one. Garland, Texas, president of NAACP, late 70s. We brought the money to our communities where they were closing our schools. They were closing black schools. So what did we do as NAACP president before the NAACP was hijacked by the progressive left when Ben Hooks was president of the National? It wasn't quite as hijacked as it is now. But we brought them into our community by creating magnet schools, same magnet schools that are in Garland, Texas today. That was a lawsuit that my organization was bringing then. We are overstating the obvious. Yep. We know what the problem is. Right. We came here today to talk about solutions. How we can fix it. Well, Congressman West, then perhaps you should weigh in on this particular question, and we are going to have to move on. Yeah, um, well, you know, I'm from Georgia, so I, I'm not long-winded too much. You know, <laughs> Chairman Cleaver you know, to his credit. And there was a great meeting that he had. He brought in some of the top uh, black executives to the Congressional Black Caucus, and we sat down and we talked about how do we incentivize, you know, that investment of capital to go back into those communities. And we've talked about what Jack Kemp, uh, you know, brought up and, and also Arthur Laffer, these urban empowerment zones. Well, the chairman of, uh, former chairman of black entertainment television, uh, Bob Johnson, said, you know, how can we look at something as simple as capital gains tax? And how can we, you know, do something to adjust capital gains tax to incentivize people to invest in, the, in minority businesses and get this thing happening in the urban city so that they get a good return and they have a lower capital gains tax because they did invest? You know, what we're talking about up here in Washington, D.C., what we need to do is incentivize economic growth. Right. It's not just the black community. It's all communities all across the United States of America. We're doing everything up here in Washington, D.C. that is counterproductive mm. to any private sector growth. Mm. You know, I grew up in the same neighborhood with Dr. King, and I remember walking down Auburn Avenue as a young kid because I went to Our Lady of Lourdes Catholic School right across the street from Ebenezer. You go down to Butler Street, YMCA, thriving businesses, professionals, everything. You go to Auburn Avenue today, it's gone. Wow. So where do we go back to the blocking and tackling of understanding what does the private sector need, black community as well, to incentivize growth, to incentivize small businesses, okay, to get back into the urban areas? Because America can only be as great as the sum of its parts. And if the black community continues down the path that it's in right now with this exorbitant unemployment and failure of small businesses, it's not going to happen. So I think the thing that we should do, and Chairman Cleaver and I are going to get together and work on this, right. we're going to come up with some tax policy that incentivizes 
small business growth back in the black community. Thank you. Oh, thank you for that, Congressman. And so appropriate and necessary. Start. Uh, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. To, to Congressman West's point, you know, for somehow or another, many conservatives think when you talk about minority business or black business, you've abandoned your conservative values. Right. That's, as, that's as silly to me as saying that if you profit, you're anti-civil rights. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, and or if you just, target investment. You know, I mean, you target yeah, investment I mean, all the time. Th that is, that is, that's just a reality. Right. You, know, you know who employs the most black people in L.A., Los Angeles? Yeah. Black people. You know who employs the most black people in Chicago? Black people. It's those black small business owners that hire people in the community. So, you know, we're not anti-Republican or anti-conservative to say we ought to incentivize people to attract investment capital into Part underserved the communities. Uh, st star, uh, star, star, fi as well. star 15 uh, seconds. Okay. Didn't get to add this to my answer since uh -huh. it was my question. <laughs> I invite you to come to Lakeland and see what we have done with enterprise zones and community redevelopment areas and creating the environment and incentive for, for redevelopment in those communities that have been hardest hit. Okay. I'd love for you to see it. All right, and you do have a wonderful community. I've actually been there before. And that for another panel discussion, we'll have to talk about that type of scenario to where the government does the work, which is where conservatives do have a problem, uh, and or removing barriers of government so that others uh, will invest in that work, which is why uh, Jack Kipp's idea was mentioned and what Romer is talking about in charter cities, as well as what the Rwandan president is talking about, Paul Kagame. He said, I am not here to beg for charity. I want prosperity. I want to build prosperity. And so he has created an environment so that they can do um, free trade. He said, I don't want foreign aid. I want free trade. Star. And I was fascinated when I saw uh, a pr product from Rwanda in our uh, Macy's here locally. Star. Yes, sir, real quick. And we're moving real, real quick. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I wasn't going to do this, but I, I have to because I experienced this firsthand in the 70s when in, in the, under the Carter administration. Um, a lot of these ideas will work. It doesn't matter if they're liberal ideas or, or conservative ideas. But the, the, the 300 pound elephant in the room, or the 3,000 pound elephant in the room, is the corruption. Uh, when you're taking 40% plus right off the top with corruption, none of these things are going to work, and that's what happens. Yeah, but that's another discussion to say whether government should do this work or should private. And, and I would like to stay with privately incentivizing, which is what Kemp had in mind, is to remove the barriers that are over our city areas so that private investment will freely flow, as opposed to what has been done to set up these structures uh, to then say, you come through me and I might give you a handout. That's some of the challenges that we have, even with our affirmative action programs. But someone mentioned, and I can't get exactly where it was, but it reminded me of the next question because it actually was a good segue, and I think it was you, Congressman West, in talking about what has changed. Our topic number three is the black church and state. And question number one is going to go to Brooks, Dr. Smith, and Bryant. Has Brooks come in yet? We are going to then have a little bit of time to open the floor on this particular one. Question one, the top three social crises in black America today, HIV, AIDS, abortion and welfare dependency are considered to be rooted in sexual conduct. Isn't it legitimate cause for black pastors to fight the for traditional definitions of marriage and the ideal of a two-parent household, which has been the foundation in the black community? And I think this was an appropriate transitional question uh, providentially because we can talk about economics all day. As a result of the expansion of government's role, the black family has collapsed. So we are going to go to Dr. Smith and ask you this question. Should the black pastors speak up on this against the hard left in their communities that are fighting against traditional values? The black pastor has to. Uh, part of the role of that black pastor is to be a prophet as well as a priest. Uh, not only concerned about the worship context within the church, but also concerned about the, the social struggles and tension that affects the congregation and the congregants. So that pastor has that responsibility to make the word of God alive and live and real and relevant in the social context and not being uh, afraid to take that particular stand. So that's why that pastor has to make sure that he or she does not allow the government to silence his or her voice. 
So we do have to be very careful in accepting government grants that can tie our hands and silence our prophetic voice. Because that, that pastor has that role and responsibility to be uh, the watch person, so to speak, of that particular community and not be afraid to, uh, to share that and be firm and, and firm in doing that and, and be honest about the sharing and, and molding and shaping uh, the, the community and not being, uh, not giving in to the surrounding pressure, but setting the standard for the surrounding community. And so that is the role of the pastor to make that happen. CL, what's the problem? Are they too in bed with the political structures of their community and might not get an invite to the party? Star has been, um, been a pastor and uh, in the clergy for over 33 years. And I have seen how political money has corrupted good men mm. in the pulpit. The pulpit now, in many cases, and in some, not many, but many, uh, in, in, in many cases, you have hustlers who have infiltrated the pulpit and are now fleecing the flock of God and now using that pulpit to push a liberal agenda. That's the truth of it. Now let's face the facts here. If we came here to talk, let's talk. The fact of the matter is this. When they in fact talk about what's wrong on Sunday morning from the Bible, their social sermon is something totally different. Why? Because they're afraid of being called bad apples. They're afraid of speak or of living the truth that they preach on Sunday mornings. And so the result of that is that even though we preach against abortion, we preach against same-sex marriage and all of that, the way the lifestyle is that's lived throughout the week encourages the congregation to go ahead on Tuesdays or Saturdays and vote on voting day for something totally different. This has to be confronted and faced in honest discussion. Now, the one thing that most Americans, even today in our comfortable lifestyles, are afraid of, and this is what the Runaway Slave movie addresses, is that there is a slave revolt that must take place in this country. And that still sparks fear in the hearts of most Americans when they think of people who they feel they have had subdued for such a long time. When they see these bad apples sitting in this room today, with the exception of maybe a few, they think that there is something to be afraid of. Herman Cain called a bad apple by a person who pulled himself up by his own bootstrings, Harry Belafonte. Why was he called that? I'll tell you why. You put 90% of this panel in the same crate, in the same barrel, with the progressive liberals that are poisoning our children in our schools, that are poisoning our communities, they will, in fact, ruin it for the progressive liberal agenda. I encourage everybody who see this type of corruption going on from the pulpit to the state house, to the White House, to become bad apples. And in fact, let's ruin it because they will indeed spoil a next generation. And they have spoiled almost two generations of people who have become enslaved to a system that must be addressed by people sitting in this room today. Well, you preach, Pastor. You know, it's interesting. I, I made a bid as a Republican in a hard-hit Democrat district uh, for Congress a year or so ago, and I lost overwhelmingly, even though I knew I had the right message, and I thought often about slavery, and I asked the question of why, I, after slavery in this country ended, uh, there were four million slaves. Why did only a million leave the South? What was wrong with the rest of them? But, but so you're right. There is a complacency star. as well as there's a need for leadership. I'm hearing my name. Th JT. 30, 30 seconds. Yes, I, I've got a conference call at noon that I'm going to have to be a part and we of. We very much appreciate you but, being but with let us. Me, I know a lot of people but I, miss you. You know, you all heard the passion. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the analogy that he shared with you, let me, let, me, let me peel the onion for you a little bit more. 
I know men that I talk to who are pastors who hadn't sold out in the pulpit on Sunday mornings. Uh, I've talked to them. I've studied with them. I've worshipped with them. And I hadn't talked to all of these men, but I'm going to name a few. Tony Evans, Fred Price, Brett Fuller, T.D. Jakes, Bill Winston, I'm sure you all can name some who's been just as consistent. They preach to mega congregations every Sunday morning, but 90% of their congregation don't vote like us. Mm -mm. They think like us, but they don't vote like us. And as I said, the first the comments that came out of my mouth is, we've got the solutions, but the pertinent question is, what does the Republican Party do to establish in its institution a mechanism that says, we hear you, we're in the trenches with you, and when those crazy things are said, you know who they called to defend it? Star uh, Parker, mm -hmm. Tim Scott, Alan West, Michael Steele, J.C. Watts, Bill Cleveland. That, that's my point. It just takes a little bit of massaging to say, we need to be at the strategic table. You want us to sell the meals, but you don't wanna, want us to buy any of the groceries. And, 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 I, and I have said that, and I'm not a Johnny come lately to this argument. I've been saying this for 20 years. I can show you the scars on my back to prove it. To the point that I, always, I run the risk of being the whiny black guy, but so be it. Well, there are you two sides that to that, that as well, J.C. If, 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 if I'm convinced it is not the truth, I've talked to these pastors. They, they've been life. They've been for life. They've been for marriage. They've been for all the things that we believe in. They preached it in the pulpit. Well, let me interject something here, though. I want to interject don't something. Like us. They don't, but here's the deal, too, because we did talk about the 33% that do poll with us, and there needs to be outreach there. But I've talked to many African Americans themselves of that 33% who are convinced that they should stay independent. Well, the Republican Democrat political world is business. And if you are not engaged in the primary part of it to work your way up, I'm not waiting for perhaps the party and the structure today to do these questions for us. We I, should I'm, take no, I, over the party. They I, I have told, their own I, problems I, I to, I totally, when it comes to the divide between totally, the left and the right. Star, the I totally party. agree. This isn't about waiting on the party. This is about the party. So, the party knows this is going on today. Yes. Congressman West invited them. I mean, <laughs> you know. I 100% I you know, agree you know, with and, you. And on. then you've got, you got the life issues. Uh, who are in the trenches? The, the African American folks who, who stand for life, who we have several stand in the as room. the people in the gap and stand Pastor. for marriage. But yet Rode they struggle over here. every year trying to raise money, trying to... Now, I understand. Uh, so, uh, again, I, and, I, and again, I'm going to be it's okay. It's twofold. You're absolutely right. There is a responsibility of those that we are attempting to represent in the community with the Republican Party, if you will. Star. And then there is a responsibility within Star. the community. Can, can and I'm going to let really? Congressman mention, had a word here. Okay, uh, first, and then Congressman Cleaver will come th to you. Thank you very much. You see, it's not the pastor's... It's what the individual does. And you see, when you get into the black media, okay, and what those congregation members are listening to, they're listening to people that are playing their music and shaping their minds. Right. And that undermines the pastor that is in the pulpit. And, and until we get, those message, get the message to those individuals that are listening in the black media, because I turn them off, I, I love their music, but they will not shape my mind. And once other people can learn that, or if we can get our message out in that same way, then we'll get the people doing what they need to do. Now, I'm going to shut Congressman. up. Congressman. Yeah, um, I've, I've been, I have a master's in divinity. I've been pastoring for 37 years, one of the largest churches in the state of Missouri. I can tell you without fear of contradiction the black church is the most conservative institution in the black community. And you, you can't get black pastors out talking about uh, doing marriages with, between uh, two men. You, I don't care how liberal they might be on, on some stuff. You can't pay them to do that. Right. And, and I, I, so I, what I'm, I guess one of the things I want to say is let, let's not create division where we don't need to. And I want to get to that a little bit later. 
Well, you did bring up another question then, <sighs> because if they're in disagreement with these activities that are now being taken over their communities, and specifically when you look at a law that was just passed in California where they will be, it will be taught in their schools, uh, perhaps their silence uh, should not be. Uh, the question number two is going to go to you again, Congressman Cleaver, Solomon, and Kay Carl. And this is about uh, Planned Parenthood. And why do traditional civil rights organizations like the NAACP, and actually I'm going to include in there the Congressional Black Caucus, because we find that most of the members of the Congressional Black Caucus join with supporting organizations like Planned Parenthood to fight the black church on abortion, with almost one in two potential black births being legally terminated. Where is the disconnection between the black community that, as you're saying, most pastors get up and they see the crises? They're weeping with that post-abortive woman. They're working that man who's struggling with his identity. Uh, and yet, when it comes to the political representation of these communities, those champions of the community, in quotes, come to Washington and undermine every single thing that the pastor has said on Sunday morning. What's the problem? Well, first of all, the Congressional Black Caucus has never taken a position on Planned Parenthood. Um, perhaps they haven't taken a, an active position uh, I mean, on Planned I, I Parenthood. When we look at the vote and support of the funding was a big deal this last go around with y'all CRs. The, it, yeah. the funding to take $330 million from a billion-dollar corporation when everybody is trying to get corporate welfare out of the city, an uh, 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 organization that is bent on destroying black children, it's written in their materials. Um, I'm just wondering, though, even if they haven't taken a formal position, why they would continue to vote for the status well, quo. Well, uh, two things. One, I, I made a statement that was a fact, and then all of a sudden, you know, they're, you know, uh, and... I, you know, anything I say, you can check it. I mean, there's, we don't, we, the, the CBC has not, never taken a position on that at all. Now, uh, on the issue of, of, of Planned Parenthood, it's a lot Thank more you. complex because uh, Planned Parenthood does more uh, than abortion. In fact, abortion ends up being a small part of what they do. They also do a lot of other, other things for, for poor women who would come for, for a number of other uh, uh, personal and private reasons that have nothing to do uh, with abortion, so it's not it's not a, a, a simple issue. But uh, you're not. I mean, you you can't find any time, and and you can uh, check with Mr. Watson. Go check in uh, wherever you. There's, the CBC has never voted on on on. We are for Planned Parenthood, and so a number of people will vote uh, against a measure, even though they might feel that there are some parts of Planned, Her Plan Planned Parenthood. That are directed to poor well, people. Perhaps not just Planned Parenthood. Let's say specifically abortion. Getting one of the 41 Congressional Black Caucus members to vote on side of pro-life has been extremely challenging. Yeah. But I want a couple others to weigh in. But I, go ahead and finish I'll say this. And I'm through. Mm -hmm. um, it's important for us. So I'm not, I'm not into the, to you know trying to fight people and all of this stuff. I mean, I I, I think. I mean, I, and, and even the language we we use, in, you know, it's, it's like it's, you know, we're mad and we right. It's defensive. Well, when you're looking well, at the kind and, of abortion and, rates in the black and, community, there are some people that are a little upset about that. That they're not hearing from their you representatives. Get, you can't get they, upset because I said we haven't taken a position on. No, 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 no. I, and and I apologize on behalf of those that but, were. Deeply the, breathing when you said that, considering today is also the March for Life. So yeah, there are the, hundreds the of thousands of pro-life activists in town. Once again, the 39th anniversary yes. of Roe v. Wade and the devastation that is done to our community. It is already illegal for the House of Representatives, because of the Hyde Amendment, to uh, 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 put any kind of money into abortion. And so many times what happens is that it's put into legislation, even though everybody knows and your two member, the two uh, my colleagues here will tell you, you, it's against the law. The Hyde Amendment has been in place since, what, 85? So people put it in legislation so we can have this argument. Because it, it won't change anything. It is not uh, uh, allowable in the United States Congress to put money 
into uh, uh, abortion. Okay, so K. Carl Smith, does the fact that the United States Congress and overwhelmingly the Congressional Black Caucus members vote for the continuance of the funding of $330 million to Planned Parenthood, although they say that they're not using that money specifically for abortion, they are a billion-dollar corporation. Uh, is this important? Should we challenge the Congressional Black Caucus? Does it matter at all if children are being killed uh, in the womb in our communities? It's a crucial issue, as, especially in the black community, and we should challenge. I think the first challenge starts with us individually. I mean, we need to take 2 Corinthians 13 and 5, examine yourself to make sure you're solid in the faith, and uh, start voting your values. That's the problem. And uh, if we start voting our values and quit having allegiance to any particular party based on family tradition and vote your values, stop being a political chump and be a Christian champion. Yeah. So that's what we need to do. And then we start agitating these politicians to adhere to the values that we want in our community. We run them, they don't run us. So that's what we need to do. We got to start voting our values and make it known through agitation. Star, if I could so, quickly. Oh, yes, um, go ahead. Please, Chef, because you're seeing a lot of the residual impact about this particular question. When you consider that um, it just breaks down all community life, the marriage rates in black America are dismal enough for you to look at having to do a job. of They're getting younger every day to cart off to jail. Without a doubt. But I just want to say this as a side note, too. And I've seen a parallel here with uh, when Congressman West talked about the silence of black conservatives. And then we talked about the pastors in the last question and some of the not standing up for on certain issues, and then I'm hearing it again in this issue. I'm one of those that believes that silence is argument carried out by other means. So I believe not taking a position is taking a position. Yes, sir. Wow. Yes, sir. All right. And Star, if I may follow up on that, we are called as pastors to identify the Caesars of this world. Jesus tells us to render unto Caesar the, the things that are Caesar and unto God the things that are God, which plainly states to us that there are some things that do belong to Caesar, like taxes, payment taxes. But there are some things that do not belong to the Caesar the, of this world, and we are called to stand in the gate when we see that happening and proclaim it. And if we do not do it, then we're not the ministers that we should be or called to be. And that's what's wrong in this uh, scenario as far as why we look into our communities and we see how they have been run down. We see how they have been affected by political voting. It is because years ago, and my pastor, Dr. Edward Jones, uh, Galilee Baptist Church, former president of the National Baptist Convention of America, I grew up in the 50s. I remember Negro Day. I remember all of those things. But I also remember how active and important the church was, and I remember what a leader he was in our community. That type of pastor who will tell it like it is. We didn't kill babies back in the 50s and 60s the way we're killing babies now. Why? Because you had someone standing up to the Caesars of this world, and that's what's failing us today. And what a segue into the next question on conservative principles in black America. Because time is running, and we are running out of it, and want to allow opportunity for the audience to weigh in. I'm going to open these next two questions, but keep your answers brief, and then we will move on to our Q&A from our audience. On family issues, 50 years ago, 70% of black children were raised by married parents. Today, 70% of black children are being raised by a single parent. Many social thinkers point to the expansion of the welfare state as cause for the breakdown of marriage in the black community. And when I say welfare state, we're talking about government engagement. Are they right or wrong? And connect that to the next question, which is, if there is a connection between government dependency and the state of black family today, why are black people so insistent to elect liberal political leaders and reject conservative leaders that espouse a message of traditional values? I'm opening up the floor to this one. Dr. Smith. Smith. 
the um congressman thank you for joining us and we're almost finished so i'm going to allow you to say a few words before we conclude dr smith the uh setting of the family is very important single uh, or both parents in the home and I, I keep going back to this because as uh C. O'Brien said that we're here for solutions. And that's why I keep going back to Frederick Douglass. Because for me, that's the that's the solution bearer. Frederick Douglass was raised, he did not have both parents in his home. Okay? But yet he uh, he developed a strategy to, to be successful anyway, in spite of the context. And there are some things he did specifically from ages 6 to 21 that helped him survive the slavery moment, but yet get prepared for freedom. Listening to stories from his grandmother, uh, reading books, avid reader. Took, he took responsibility for his own education. He was, he was courageous, fought his master for two hours, won the, won the fight with his former master, and then lived to tell about it and read about it. All right, then I'm going to transition the question in to open up, and Congressman West, I'm open up to you to say, then should we get rid of all governmental programs that are assisting the poor so that people will look toward more responsible behaviors and or uh, activities, considering when Frederick Douglass was here, we didn't have a welfare state? Well, uh, first of all, I'll say that you don't want to take away all government programs because the Constitution, one of its mandates is to promote the general welfare. But I think that what we have to understand is every child born in the United States of America, every person that comes to the United States of America gets a ladder. And that ladder is the ladder of equality of opportunity. Now, sometimes you're going to slip off the ladder. And that's why you have to have a safety net. And that's where government needs to see itself as a safety net. But the point of a safety net is for you to bounce back up and get back on that ladder and continue to climb. But I think that what we have in this country right now, and, and it comes back to the very simple argument of equality of opportunity versus equality of achievement. Because some people are saying that the safety net becomes a hammock. And you just lay there. Mm -hmm. That's not what America is about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we had listened to Senator Daniel Patrick Monaghan, mm -hmm. when he said, if you take the man out of the home, you will destroy the community. See, equality of opportunity leads to economic freedom. Mm -hmm. Equality of achievement leads to economic dependency. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do is what I said, limited government, constitutionally mandated, fiscally responsible. That's what we have to get back to. And, and I think that then you will see, not just in the black community, but all communities across the United States of America, uh, a better day. But it really comes down to opportunity versus achievement. Congressman Jordan, I would like for you to take this opportunity to introduce yourself formally and especially some of the specifics that the Republican Study Committee is looking at in terms of GOP outreach, considering that before you came in the room, Republican structure was beat up a little bit. So you have to, you're, I think you're the only one that has um, responded to the invite, as it was said, and yet you have, uh, in my opinion, one of the best committees uh, in, represented here in Washington, D.C., because you're all conservatives looking for conservative or Christian principles in the law. Let me do just a couple things if I could start, and, and thanks for having me, and let me thank Colonel West for putting this together and his, his tremendous leadership at this, uh, this important time in our country. Um, and I, I did want to apologize, too. I had a delayed flight, and we I had heard. to speak at Concerned Women for America, so I, I, I apologize. L let, me, um, let me say it this way. The Colonel was just talking about um, the family, and if you think about it, the institution that ultimately determines the strength of our entire society, our entire culture, is the family. The first institution the good Lord put together wasn't the church, wasn't the state, it was the family. And so when you have uh, a, a welfare-type structure that says, particularly to the unwed mom out there, uh, don't get a job, don't get married, have more kids, and you get more money, you have to readjust that to, to focus on the right kind of things. And, and that's, that's what we should be focused on doing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we try to do that the Republican Study Committee, have a pro-family bias to everything we do. Um, I think that's just critical. It's the reason I got into politics, uh, to try to look to do things that benefit that institution. But let me just say this, because I'm late and I get back to... And missed uh, your question, yeah, so I'll have yeah. to ask you later. I want uh, your opinion on them. On record, so C-SPAN will have to stay as well. There we go. Um, <laughs> let me just thank you for being involved, uh, for taking the risk that's always associated when you try to make a difference. You know, it's, it's easy to sit on the sidelines and criticize, but you folks are, are getting involved in, in truly trying to make a difference. Uh, and when you do that, there is, there is persecution that comes with it. There certainly is. And I, I, I appreciate your willingness to, 
take the risk associated with trying to accomplish anything of meaning or significance. I love the line that uh, uh, Cal Thomas taught. Anyone ever read Cal Thomas, syndicated columnist? He's, he was talking about sometimes the way that the elite national press sees things different than, than normal Americans. And he had a great line when he was talking about sometimes how we'll get abuse from the press for positions we take and things we say. Uh, Cal Thomas says, I get up every morning, I read my Bible and the New York Times so I can see what each side's up to. <laughs> and, you know, there's certainly some, some truth to that. So thank you for taking uh, the risks that sometimes come with uh, fighting for not just conservative p- positions, but pro-family positions. I, I, I really appreciate that. And uh, again, we at the Republican Study Committee try to stay focused on that and, and taking the risk that's associated with, with true leadership, just like Colonel West has done and, and so many on this, and, uh, on this panel have done time and time again. Thank you. Now I'm going to go to the audience, and first I'm going to call on Garland Hunt because Garland represents prison fellowship as well, uh, the president there. So if you would ask the first question, go. actually I would like some comments because when we talked about the family, uh, I almost segued us into what you're dealing with going into these prisons, and we see these young boys who have mis- manage their lives and much be as a result of some of the things we discussed here today. Thank you for joining us. Yes, first of all, thank you. Thank, thank you very much for this opportunity. I was going to respond to this because as we're talking about the whole idea of how the nation as well as GOP responds to the concerns of the African American community, one of the areas that we have to deal with are the issues that face us. And coming from uh, President Fellowship, I noticed that we didn't mention today some of the incredible disparity that's in the the criminal justice system Mm -hmm. and those that are incarcerated. Now, you know, America is actually the number one country in the world in in leading incarceration, the rate of incarceration. And that being the case... Two million. That's right. It's over two million. That's exactly right. 798,000 are African-American. And, and as a result of that, Star, that you have mostly half of those, when they are actually going into the system, then the question is not only are they going in, but they're also coming right back out. 700,000 are released every year. That's more than the whole state of Wyoming. Right. But then if that's the case, how do we stop the recidivism rate where they're literally going back? Over 67% of those that come out go right back in. And so all these situations are even more amplified in the black community. If you're black, you're nine times more likely to spend time in prison or, uh, and be arrested. In reality, the constantly in every case, well, one out of three young black men that are between the ages of 20 to 29 are either in j- prison, jail, probation, or parole. And I just want to say to you that that's why we have to work on reentry, that's why we've committed and focused. That's a group we can change. We can change the responses. We can change the heart. Once something in their character changes morally and biblically, what happens is they begin to be a different person. And I just want to challenge us in that regard because the prison population, are being, they're being recruited by Islam, they're being recruited by other faiths, but we have to recognize that those coming out can champion our communities. And in Thank fact, that's where we have to start. Well, and I appreciate those comments, and particularly because has been asked twice about solutions. Prison Fellowship and the program that they have is on the solution side. And we have other solution makers in the audience as well. Um, I see Dean Nelson from Carinet, and we know that Carinet umbrellas many of the crisis pregnancy centers across the country. I think you're up to 12 or 1,300 now of the 5,000 crisis pregnancy centers in the country that are helping people as a result of decisions that they have made, perhaps even their families have made, because they're in these broken homes and or broken communities. I'm going to open up for questions. We have about five minutes, and so I'm going to start. I see Catherine's hand, this young lady, this gentleman, and I think I'm going to leave it there for now, and we'll see where we are. So if you make it quick, um, if you would, young lady, uh, head over here. I the city West. congressman. Um, especially Congressman Cleaver, you indicated that the Hyde Amendment prohibits funding going to, for abortion, yet Title X specifically says that that money cannot go to an agency that performed uh, abortion as a method of family planning. How is it that $365 million taxpayer dollars goes to Planned Parenthood every We're leaving this event at this point. We do want to let you know that it's available on our website. To see, again, go to cspan.org. Uh, 